I'm not going to get used to that music. Good morning. Um, this is a lot. Like, I didn't know exactly how many of you there were going to be right now, but it's nice to see all of you. And uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I only have one slide that I want to keep up for the duration of this presentation. Um, this is a map. This is a map of the city of Toronto. But specifically, you can see at the top, it says black population percentage, city of Toronto, 2016. This is from David Holchansky at the University of Toronto as part of some recent census data that he was using and his team at U of T have been using to talk about inequality um, and in this case, discrimination in the city of Toronto. Without getting too deep into what you can see in front of you, the darker kind of pinky red areas are the areas of the city of Toronto with the highest concentration of black residents and the areas that are essentially, if you're looking at the map and they just look kind of like gray or white to you, those are the areas with the lowest average density of the black population in the city of Toronto. And without really looking too deeply into this, you see something very striking that I would like to spend my time talking with you about this afternoon, this morning. And um, I want to talk about what we call what we see on this image here. Because what we call it is very, I think, insightful for me in terms of how we then choose to address it. David Holchansky uses a very simple word to describe what is on this map. And I thank Tessie for the presentation just before us because you talked about segregation. This, what you see on this map, this is called segregation. That's what it is. There's no other word for it. And it's the word that I'm grateful that David Holchansky uses in his research when he talks about our city and how it looks and how it has been developed and how it's working today. Um, David Holchansky's research cites four reasons for why in 2018 Toronto is the increasingly unequal city that it is. And we could spend lots of time talking about that, but our city is becoming more and more unequal over time. David Holchansky gives four major reasons for this, three of which I'm sure many of us in this room might be really comfortable talking about, and one which I'm sure most of you are not. David Holchansky cites, uh, first of all, the lack of, or the loss of jobs that were sustaining to people in the city of Toronto jobs that were well-paying, jobs that were unionized, jobs that meant you could uh, maybe look towards home ownerships. The loss of those kind of jobs in the GTA is one of the reasons for increasing income inequality and polarization. Another uh, uh, factor that Holchansky contributes is governments. Government policies causing income polarization, government choices about taxation, government choices about where they were going to spend or not spend. Uh, he also talks uh, about, um, excuse me guys, just forgive me, I'm a little bit nervous, but transfer payments to social assistance changing, the way that we fund housing changing. These are factors that have increased income, or sorry, inequality and polarization in the city of Toronto. But the fourth factor that David Holchansky cites that he says, and I agree with him that nobody wants to talk about, is called discrimination. I talk in my work in the city of Toronto and in this country, I talk about anti-black racism. I don't just talk about discrimination. I don't just talk about racism. I talk about anti-black racism because that's what you're looking at when you look at this image on the screen. You're looking at one of the end 
results of a city that continues to discriminate against people of African descent in very specific ways. It is not an accident that this most multicultural city that we are all talking about so proudly about. Look at the center of this map. Look at the downtown core, okay? Look at the strip kind of along either side of Young Street in the middle of the city of Toronto. Like, is that an accident? It can't be. As Toronto gets more black and brown, the center of the city of Toronto, the downtown core of the city of Toronto gets more white. This is the reality of the city that we're living in today. And I know most people don't even want to talk about that reality, let alone say, well, why is that happening? But I just want to really quickly give you an idea of what it means day to day. What this pattern of anti-black racism in our city and in this country actually means for people living in the areas mostly where you see. First of all, it means obviously that all of the city services that are downtown, that all of the entertainment and shopping and all of the things that people come downtown to access, all the jobs, are mostly not where black people in the main live in the city of Toronto. That means that we, if we're going to work, have to travel to those places, but the transit sucks where black and brown people mostly live in the city of Toronto also. And so you have to spend a lot more time to be able to go and access these opportunities. And that takes away from your quality of life. Um, one of the most interesting and misunderstood things about police carding in the city of Toronto, this phenomenon of the Toronto police force, which continues, by the way, please don't be fooled by our police calling by a different name the same discriminatory practices of stopping us on the street. Anybody who says that that's not happening anymore must not be hanging around, I would say, in a lot of these communities, but, 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 at its highest, carding has been going on disproportionately in areas where white people in the city live, not in the areas shaded by the dark red rose kind of color that you're seeing up there. In other words, I am more likely to be stopped in these areas with the white shades and the gray shades than I am to be stopped in the areas where most black people are living, according to the statistics that the police themselves kept. These are stops that violate the law that we're supposed to all be living under in this country, which is the right to just, you know, walk or drive without being harassed, without being searched, without having your property seized. This is still denied in your city, but it's happening in white areas because it's white people who are calling police on black people and saying, you must not be here for the right reason. We need to investigate you. We need to interrogate you. This is what that actually looks like. So we can't even come into the areas where we are not designated by the city to live because then the police are gonna be looking for us being like, why are you here though? What this looks like for me is a friend of mine who works for one of the largest institutions in this city. This friend of mine is black and is a woman and was trying to find housing and had a letter from this very large in institution in this city and was turned down f time after time after time. Makes a good income, but landlords who are free to do what they want in the city of Toronto in 2018 still don't want to rent to us, even when we have money. It's discrimination, it's segregation. It's not South Africa apartheid. It's your city right now where we're sitting having this conversation. So I could go on about that, but what I want to say to you is that what you are seeing up here on the screen and what I'm trying to describe to you and what black people are living in this city, it's discrimination, it's segregation, it's anti-black racism. And I'm not going to tell you what to do about it because I only have 10 seconds left on this clock, but um, if you can't say that this is segregation, if you can't even say that as people who are thinking about the future of our city, 
If you can't call this discrimination, if you can't call this anti-black racism, if you're not even willing to call this what it is, what chance do you really have of addressing it? What chance do you really have of listening to the people who are living that segregation and anti-black racism and incorporating their needs into the notion of city building in 21st century Toronto? What chance do you really have of doing that if you won't even describe our life conditions accurately and fairly? What is maybe the investment that some of you in this room have of not saying that that's anti-black racism? of not saying that that is segregation. What do you fear you might lose if you start using this language? What do you think other people around you might start saying and thinking about you if you start talking like this? Because that's a choice that you can make. I cannot stop being black in the city of Toronto unless I leave. Which is another thing that a lot of young, brilliant black people in the city are doing because we can't get the opportunities that we deserve. We're just going somewhere else. And having been here almost 15 years now and going through a really tough summer that we just had, uh, I can relate to that feeling, but I don't want to leave my city. I want to stay in the city and I want opportunities and equality and equity and fairness for me and all black people in the city of Toronto. So if nothing else over the course of the next couple of days that we're going to be having these conversations, I encourage you to think about your language and to challenge your language because if you cannot call racism, and segregation for what it is, you cannot affect any change. You have to actually begin to describe reality before you even think about addressing it, I guess. Thank you very much, thank you.